Okay, so after I juice the hammers up like that, I do want to see where that strike point should be. I'm really happy with the difference it made. Makes me feel a lot more hopeful about this being an awesome piano. A lot of times the Steinways, you know, their limiting area of the range is right here in this, I'm up here, it's in this yeah. kind of melody section, ironically, right? Because right. that's right where you want to speak out. Right. And I don't know if that's why, but um, so. And is it just in between these two bars? Is that specifically where it it's is? It's usually weakest, usually right after the break. These notes okay. are actually fairly strong and they get oh. in my ear actually. <laughs> I don't know if it's just my ear. Sure. Some of these notes can really just rattle my brain. Yeah. And then, but when you get about to A5, B flat, B, somewhere in there, there's sometimes a drop off okay. without doing something to compensate, hardening the hammer or something like that. And sometimes the two notes on this side of the break, I notice can be really just not much there. Sure. I mean, it's a short string, right? We're asking a lot of this little string yeah, and this exactly. little piece of the soundboard. Tiny. All the same, we love it when it's like just gorgeous up there. So, and we really just maximize quick, maximize it. This is this is probably too basic. Can you just take our audience through when you said A five or whatever? Oh yeah. Um, just kind of show us because it, it's it's quick to understand once you've established. But I know that's A zero down there, which is a little confusing. I would love to take our audience <laughs> through that because it makes my life so much easier. Yeah, so when your tuner it comes, so you don't say 3D's above middle C. Yeah, or whatever system it is, you know, D, triple prime, what, what is, you know, I, yeah. even though I was a music, you know, I studied music, but I still don't like that system, whatever, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> forgive me whoever invented that system, but it just doesn't work for the piano very well. So A, zero, because, okay, <clears throat> we're thinking of, for some reason we like C on the piano, right? It's do, uh -huh. uh, I think, in most countries. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> So um, anytime we have a full octave, we're going to go ahead and number the octaves. 88 notes on the piano, there's eight full octaves, right? Okay. So this is C1 right here. C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, C8. Okay. Okay. Uh, this little piece that we have of three notes on the bottom, we just give them A0, A sharp 0, B0. Okay. Perfect. So if you're working with a technician, it could be very helpful, you know, oh, this note's a little hot, this note doesn't repeat so well. It's really helpful for me to, ha you know, if I have a concert pianist come through and they leave a few notes and say, hey, work on this, you know, G sharp four, except the caveat to that is don't get the, don't write it wrong. <laughs> don't say G flat. I had a pianist that was playing something where she was going like this the whole concert. the repetition on that note uh-huh and, and and so she wrote on her notes g4 instead oh. of g sharp four uh-huh i didn't have enough time to go through the whole piano and make it right i had to just go with her notes uh-huh so i worked very diligently on the wrong note <laughs> and i checked in with her after the concert she said yeah these other notes were better with the repetition but that the one that was the most important was sure. still bad <laughs> At least I know what I did would have solved the problem. I went back to the piano later and did it, but yeah, so get it right. <laughs> C1, 2, 3, 4, middle C, C4. And do you like to specify sharps or flats or you don't care? I don't care, I'm a musician, you know. Right, yeah. You, you know, but uh, when, when tuners use, um, you know, a digital tuning device to, to help them tune, it's usually the nomenclature is only to use a sharp. Okay, <clears throat> good but, to know. So just a little side note there, leave notes for your tuner and label them with the right number. It's very quick that way. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, because there isn't enough time to do everything on a piano that you need to do. You really need to prioritize and that really helps the process. Okay, so we set the strike point where we want it, but right now it sounds terrible. Right now there's hardly any sound coming out of there because we put more paraloid on it, which is now drying. Oh, okay. So as soon as you put that liquid on there, it's not hard yet. And I put it from A on up. So listen. It's an Huge. instant drop off. You know? But uh -huh. this is almost where the piano started, right? Right. This yeah. is kind of what it was voiced like before we started working on it. So. And that is something as well that I just want to just touch on briefly is you adjust to pianos so quickly. 
um, not as I'm saying as the yeah. pianist you adjust. So you might think, oh geez, my my technician didn't brighten this enough, even though he brightened it significantly because you get used to it after a day and you still want it brighter, or vice versa. Like I want that to be softer and softer. So try to make recordings at home of your piano so that you can compare and see how far your piano has actually come. Sometimes we get delusional when we're eight hours a day at the piano or however long of what actually has happened. So yeah. just a little side note. Oh, definitely, yeah. It's easy to get lost when I'm voicing for hours on end. You know, it's good to step away from it and come back sure. to it. It's different. You, you realize, oh, it's not sounds what I thought. Good. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds pretty good. Okay, we're going <clears> to... <throat> bed the keyframe. The keyframe was the thing we were sliding in and out. And I have some adjustable glides down in here, and I think we're getting this on my head cam. These adjustable glides correspond with a smooth brass piece underneath, and we're gonna run that down so it makes firm contact all the way across the keyboard, giving a good solid foundation down there. Um, if it's floating, the action is just kind of spongy. Okay. So, and also if they're raised and they're not quite hitting the wood, you can get a knock sometimes. Usually you'll get a knock up on this front rail if it's not bedded, correct? Yeah, we actually got that on my Hamburg the other oh, day. Oh yeah, on the yeah. bass, that's very yeah. common. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's annoying, you know, it, if you hear like a big thump and a click, you know, and you have a Steinway, it's probably on the ends and it's probably because it's floating a little bit. Gotcha. So, you, run me through that. I was a little distracted with uh, getting the cam set right. So we're just adjusting the, we're adjusting the height of these? We're adjusting these glide bolts. Okay. Yeah, underneath, they, they're the things that make contact with the key bed. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to simulate pedaling a heavy pedaler. I'm going to pedal pretty hard okay. on the sustain pedal down here, and then I'm going to pedal, then I'm going to push the middle pedal, then I'm going to use my knee to like shove the lyre down. Okay, don't <laughs> okay. do this, don't try this at home. <laughs> and look, if when I do that, I get a knock here. Uh-huh. So I know I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bet that here I don't get a knock on this bolt. So I'm gonna first of all I'm gonna raise them all to where they're knocking. Okay. And it's this right here. Because when I know they're knocking, I know they're in really close proximity. I know right where they are. Okay. Notice I made this one knock. Now this one's not knocking because they, they're, they're interactive, sure. right? You lower yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. So I kind of have to hit it in a few, with a few passes here. So you kind of start with it neutralized where everything's knocking, then just tighten it back down to the point where it's not. To where it's just making firm enough contact, but not adding too much extra friction for when the, the keyboard is, is uh, shifting. Sure. Now look really close. So I'm going to do this with my head cam too. As I push down on this glide, see the keys floating, moving up and down. Uh -huh. That's because there's no firm contact there. And as soon as I engage this, let's see, it's still knocking. So now I'm going to do it a little further. There, now it's not knocking. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to push down on it now. They don't move. Okay. It's just an illustration. It's giving you a real solid foundation. You're not losing the energy you're putting into the piano. I see. It's giving it back to you. Yeah. That's one of the things I love about Steinway, this good hard wood, you know, just really good woods in the, in the action frame. So it just feels so solid to play on as long as it's bedded properly. Okay, great. A lot of other pianos, it just feels kind of flimsy. Okay. Or can, I should say. Yeah. Okay, so here I'm gonna... Now I lower it to where I don't get a knock, but I can lift it with my fingers and I can get a knock. So oh, then I sure. know I'm not making too firm a contact. Maybe that's getting too nerdy, but. Are you lifting the pin with your fingers? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm very strong. So, <laughs> honestly, the hardest part, one of the hardest things for new technicians when I'm teaching someone is to get a knock, to be able to hit it with enough force to get it to knock. Oh. <laughs> Apparently that's difficult, but I've been doing it so long I don't I forget. So. And why is this not done at the factory? It this, is. Oh, okay. This is something that changes weekly, daily. Oh, okay. With the weather. Now, that being said, I mean, a new piano will change quite a bit. But um, once I do it, it goes through the different seasons of the year. Once I've done it a few times, it pretty much settles down and it stays bedded. Okay. 
So particularly with a new piano or just a piano that has not been maintained to speak of, sure. you probably need to bed the keyframe. And this directly affects the touch and what we were talking about with the key travel, the key dip, how far the key goes down. Uh -huh. If I raise these, if I engage these and make and raise the action by lowering those down, it increases the key dip. Oh, okay. Drastically. So it's like a, you can kind of regulate a piano in a quick fix wholesale by adjusting these down. You can increase your dip. Now, if they were bedded too firmly, and this rail, it's pushing this rail really high, the key height's really high, and so you have more key travel, then you could also decrease your dip by adjusting them. Oh, okay. So, you know, it might be a good practice to kind of set them in the middle, but. So as you tighten them, the keys are raised, thus increase, am I getting this wrong? No, that's right, it's kind so of like tightening. Thus, I mean, they don't get tighter, they go down. Okay. And they push the, the balance rail up, and the keys get higher. Which increases your key. But this rail stays, yeah. So the key your, goes higher. And, and so, so you have, have a higher dip. key. Okay. Yep. Wow. So that could have drastic yeah. consequences. Oh, yeah. Then, so. But I, I love it because at the end of regulating, you're like, this kind of just feels a little too shallow. Uh-huh. Crank them down a tiny bit. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So it's a really great. That's really cool. Adjustment. You hear key bedding, you're like, ah, oh, this is going to be a snoozer segment. <laughs> and uh, that's probably one of the biggest consequences of this whole process, I would imagine. Yeah. OK. So I got them all very uniform. So I'm liking that. And this is where this is still drying, remember? It's getting a little stronger. Uh-huh. But still not there. But don't, don't fear, you know, it'll come back. Yeah. So. Okay.